Okay. So any, everybody can see it all right? Okay, good. Okay, so today's um, talk is going to be about language and meaning of occult symbology. I've called it part one purely because there's not enough time to go through it all. There's too many symbols, too many um, occult symbologies to go through. It's a whole, it will take you years to study. You have to do a PhD in it to, you know, like the equivalent of a PhD, you know, to get into the meanings behind all the symbols and um, the way they use them. So that's, this is the tree of good and evil in the um, uh, a, a, a tree of good and evil, uh, of good and evil knowledge tree, basically from secret symbols of the Rosicrucians, by um, Eckhart, 1788. He's done some amazing drawings. You can find this uh, this manuscript that he's he's done, and uh, you can find it in the British Library. Uh, so if you want to study a bit more about sort of the symbology and the cult, the alchemical tables and how they use alchemy as part of the way they affect the human psychology. Uh, it's a huge study, but uh, this is one, one of the main references I use. So this is the alchemical table of symbols. Um, just kind of have a cursory glance at some of the symbols on there, and you may find some familiar symbols you may have seen in, in everyday advertising or corporate logos. Um, this, uh, I, I believe, the hermetic um, practices of alchemy has been around for thousands of years, but um, not many, not many people know exactly the origins of it. Some say it's from the Hebrew language. I doubt it. Um, there's a lot of uh, the symbology that looks very druidic in, in terms of the linguistics when you look at the language of the druids and the Celts. Uh, it has a very similar sort of uh, symbology, as it, as it does with the hieroglyphs and ancient Babylonian Sumerian uh, texts as well. So this, this is something that can, kind of can be drawn from all over the world, um, and from all cultures around the world, even including the Mayans. Um, I just want to draw your attention to one particular one on here, uh, which is this symbol for sulfur. Um, so it's an upward pointing, where is it? So it looks like a cross, so many symbols here. It's better to look on here. So if I put my mouse Is that on the top top left? Top left. That's the uh, uh, quintessence symbol of quintessence. There's so many meanings behind these symbols. Um, so, like for example, the three dots here, as you can see where my mouse is, that's uh, the symbol for oil. Um, this symbol up here, with the three lines, uh, four lines across, oh, let's go back. So the symbol with four lines across is the amalgam, when you mix the chemicals together. That's the symbol for amalgamy, an amalgamation. You have carbon here, which is in this sort of, uh, sort of same as the letter C, really, uh, on the uh, sort of top right, second row from that. Uh, that one on the right here as well, that one is quintessence on the opposite end. On the top left and on the right, that's the symbol for essence. So there's a lot of symbology within the alchemical table, which uh, reflects the, uh, the sciences, but the hermetic sciences, the sciences that we don't see. Um, and it's interesting how they've used this symbol here, if you see at the bottom where my mouse is, uh, which is the symbol for uh, here, uh, for hour, for hour. So that's the, that's the hourglass, we get the hourglass shape. So you see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, and that's the symbol for the hourglass there. And one in particular, you can see one that's wood on this. Sand. Okay, you have lime here. And vinegar, 
which is in the shape of a cross. You can see that. Um, you have the tallow, which is in the shape of an X, or symbol of an X, the letter X. Again, these uh, symbols are very ancient and very old. You have the wick, which is this symbol here. Um, the one I'm looking for is the symbol for sulfur. Uh, so where is it? Oh yeah, if you draw your eyes to the bottom left, you have the symbol for fire, uh, water, air, and earth. So interesting how they use, again, the triangles. As we can see in symbology, the triangle is quite prominent in corporate, in royal dynasties, in various secret societies, they use this, uh, the, the triangle. Um, also the zodiac signs. If you look at the zodiac signs, you have the sign for Aries, okay, which is obviously symbolized by the, the Capricorn or the, um, the horns of a goat or the horns of a ram, mostly. Um, then you have Taurus, and each one represents uh, a p particular... Uh, so this one's calcination, they call it calcination or calcification. Interesting, because we see that this uh, use of symbol is used a lot uh, in, in sort of modern times at the moment, in advertising and uh, in media. You have Gemini, which is the two, uh, the twin towers, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's also a symbol for fixation. Okay, that's fixation. Cancer, you have this symbol here. And I always liken the symbol to cancer to the yin and yang. It's, it represents, to me, it represents dualism. Having looked at sort of our chemical tables and looked at the symbols around the world, we have the two sixes in juxtaposed positions on, on a sort of horizontal um, uh, angle. And it, if you were to put them together, it will create the yin yang sign. It's interesting how that as well goes in with the, yin, the sign of the yin yang. Uh, you have the sign of Leo here. Which, uh, sorry, so go back to cancer. Cancer represents solution. This could be a liquid solution, right? So it's not necessarily a solution to a problem, right? And um, for Leo, uh, this, this symbol here represents digestion. And for Virgo, which we can see is like a letter M. And I don't know if you recognize this symbol here. We see it in like uh, the cancer logos, you know, when you have like uh, the cause of cancer. You know, they, they usually have that ribbon on there. And I think they've used the ribbon, that ribbon symbol quite a few times in different um, areas. And this represents distillation. And when we go into, Ver uh, so when we go to Libra, you have uh, the representation of sublimation. Sublimation. Interesting how that, that particular, this one here, looks like uh, the omega symbol in Greek, in, Greek, in the Greek language. Uh, just to go there, going across to the letter M, it looks like a letter M with a tail, a sort of devilish tail. Um, and this is the symbol of Scorpio, and that symbol represents separation. Okay. The reason I'm going through these is, to, is so that you can get a better understanding of the representations of these symbols so that when you go out into the world and you look at logos and you look at advertising, you'll see that these have a, a sort of psychological uh, subconscious effect on your, on your mind. Okay? Because we're dealing with people who, who understand, know how to deal with mind control and they've been doing this for a very, very long time. So... Um, and this is why it's so important to recognize and study these symbols so you know what's going on in your subconscious. And because when you bring it to the fore and you know what it represents, you're then empowered and you're not hypnotized uh, in, in a way or, or subconsciously hijacked through these symbols and advertising and so on. When we go out in the street, they're everywhere. I mean, I didn't ask for permission. Who gave you permission to put that in my face? You know? So it's that sort of at least let us empower ourselves with the understanding of what this means and what this does to the psyche and what it does to our body because we have an emotional body so what goes into the subconscious goes into the emotional body We're not, the emotional body has a mind of its own you know when you talk about the gut feeling you know you have a gut feeling about somebody that's a different type of intelligence to the brain to the mind 
So this is something that they know and um, it, it's very important to arm ourselves with this knowledge. Uh, next, uh, moving on uh, from the separation symbol of Scorpio, we go to Sagittarius, which looks like an arrow, and we get that in, in the uh, zodiac as well. Um, it's pointing to the top right, it's a right angle, um, 45 degree angle, and this symbol represents serration, serration, which is burning, form of burning. Um, I think that's what it means. I've got to look it up again. Uh, but moving on, Capricorn. Okay, again, looks like the number six combined with the number seven. Right? It looks like a number six with a number seven. And uh, this symbol of Capricorn, uh, again, you can kind of see it. If you tilt it to, the, to, to a sort of 90 degree angle more downwards, you'll see it represents the ram and the horn again. No, you know, the... Um, Capricornian horn, the twirling horn of the Capricorn. So seven and six. And this uh, symbol represents fermentation. Uh, and then we move on to Aquarius, the waves, right? We always see these waves. We see these in uh, company corporate logos, the waves. Um, and uh, that represents water, obviously. And um, uh, the representation of that in the alchemical table is multiplication, to multiply. Finally, we've got uh, the symbol of Pisces, which looks like a letter H or two crescent moons with a cross um, line across it. So again, you can see how the influence of our letters in the English and Western languages has, an, has, an influence, has had an influence on our, the way we draw our letters. So that's the uh, Pisces, which represents projection, what we project. So, I mean, there's other processes, and I'm, I, what I'll do, uh, this is from a, a website called egrogordesign.com, and it's fantastic. It refers back to the, one of the oldest documents of the alchemical table, and it's just been redrawn and uh, revi revived, basically, from... From what it was so what I'll do is once um, this is up on the video uh, I'll, I'll be able to put the references to all the links and you can check out this and study it in more detail so you have a better grasp of all the meanings of what these symbols are um, I'm just trying to find uh, the um, the symbol for uh, sulfur is it on the, on the right hand side Second line down. Is that so sulfur though? Sulfur, sulfur, sulfur. It's basically a, a symbol Is that, that looks like a cross, but it's facing upwards. Oh, that's not sulfur, is it? No. Ooh, going back. I just want to point out this particular symbol for the rest of the uh, presentation, because it's quite an important, uh, significant symbol. We're going to see why. No, that's, that, that symbol is uh, the universal seed. That's a symbol for universal seed. So when you look at that symbol and why we see the cross and the circle, that's the symbol for the universal seed. Um, Mercury is a good one here. This one's good to look at. Look at this symbol here, Mercury. Okay, yeah, it has a sort of crescent moon and it looks like the Ankh, which I'll be going through uh, later on and, and telling you about the origins of the cross um, so what we'll do we'll move on we'll, we'll talk about the cross uh, the cross as you know has been around for a very long time it predates Christianity it's much older uh, the Celts have used it and um, we're just going to go into one of the more ancient symbolic representations of the Ankh. It's called the Ankh. So the Ankh is defined as the symbolic representation of both physical and eternal life, according to Egyptians. It is uh, known as the original cross, which is a powerful symbol that was first created by Africans in ancient Egypt. The Ankh is commonly known to mean life in the language 
of um, ancient Kemet, because Kemet was the actual uh, name for Egypt. So this is, again, the word Egypt is, again, a new Western invention, a new label. The actual land of Egypt was called Kemet. Um, renamed Egypt by the Greeks, so the Greeks renamed it. It is also a symbol for the power to give and sustain life. The Ankh is typically associated with material things such as water, which um, was believed by the Egyptians to regenerate life. We know the power of water. Um, air, sun, as well as with the gods who are frequently pictured carrying an Ankh. So when you, you'll see some of these ancient Egyptian deities like uh, Horus, Osiris, all carrying this sort of key-like uh, uh, symbol on their hand. And it just represents, now you know what it represents, is the meaning behind it, is, is it represents life. Uh, the Egyptian king is often associated with the Ankh also, either in possession of an Ankh, providing life to his people, or being uh, given an Ankh, or stream of Ankhs by the gods. Uh, there are numerous examples that have been found that were made from metal, clay and wood. It is usually worn as an amulet to, to extend uh, the life of the living and place on the mummy to energize the resurrected spirit. Um, we have this practice again, I'll go through, uh, when I go through the um, next subject of geomancy, you'll see that the use of um, certain amulets, uh, Precious gold symbols, wood, and crystals were always buried with the ancestors. Something that we've lost touch of due to uh, one of the interference of monotheism um, and the, the basic genocide of all the, uh, the Druidic and pagan cultures that used to exist here in the West that they've completely eradicated, pretty much. Um, so we have this sort of amnesia, sadly. And this is actually an amnesia all over the world. So we have, um, you know, the, the, uh, even the pagan Arabs to the pagan Africans to the pagan Eastern cultures to the Mayan cultures. It's, it, you all used to be pagan before, you know, it got eradicated through Christianity and the monotheistic religions. The gods and kings are often shown carrying the Ankh to distinguish them from mere mortals. The Ankh, the Ankh symbolized eternal life and bestowed immortality on anyone who possessed it. It is believed that life energy emanating from the Ankh can be absorbed by anyone within certain proximity. An Ankh serves as an antenna or conduit for the divine power of life that permeates the universe. The amulet is a powerful talisman uh, that provides the way of protection from the evil forces of decay and degeneration. Um, again, you've got to kind of look at this metaphorically, not in a literal sense. All right, we are mortals, you know, we do decay, we do. But uh, they understand that this symbol symbolized eternal life, the life of the soul, right? They understood that, that our souls are eternal, not our bodies. So one painting shows the goddess Hathor uh, holding the Ankh up under the nose of uh, Nefertari, Queen Nefertari received the breath of life from the goddess herself. Uh, this is again one of the um, scriptures, but this is, you also have Anubis here given to Amenhotep II. Uh, and Amenhotep II uh, was just before the hijack of the Hyksos when we talked about hidden history. And those of you who haven't uh, seen it, I'll share that video as well. So Hathor was one of the great goddesses. She was the goddess of women, female sexuality, and motherhood. Hathor was the protector of joy, music, and happiness. Uh, this popular goddess was a uh, goddess also to foreign lands. Egyptian, uh, Egyptians often worked in mines in other countries, therefore she was also the natural patron goddess of miners. Uh, so we also have the kind of, um, the, the pickaxe, we see that a lot in symbology. Um, and the Queen Nefertati was the wife of Ramesses the Great. She was one of the most popular queens of ancient Egypt. So the loop of Ankh 
is held by the gods. It is associated with Isis and Osiris in the uh, early dynastic period. And the loop of Ankh also represents the uh, feminine discipline uh, of or the womb. Okay, you will see that that loop you see at the top of that Ankh represents the female, but also it represents the female. Well, the elongated section represents the masculine discipline or the or the male genitalia, basically. Um, but you can also say that the the uh, female representation could also be the female genitalia also, because of uh, the shape. The Ankh represents the male and female principle is taught that the circle at the top represents the female sexual organ, while the stump at the bottom, uh, the male organ, and the cross line represents the children of the union. So in this way, it represents the sexual union or fertility. In Kemet, Egypt, uh, the word for mirror was also the same as Ankh. Or Ankh. I don't know how they pronounce it, but I think it's, it's pronounced in that sort of way. Perhaps showing the way death and life are the mirror to one another. Okay. Again, it goes back to eternal life, that we don't really die. So, more on the fertility meaning. Here you can see this uh, representation of Osiris sending, and then you have the two, uh, the two goddesses, or the two queens. We see this symbology as well in Christian uh, symbology also. Um, as a symbol of fertility, the loop represented the female genital organ and the, and the line below represented the male genital organ, as we said before. Uh, this also reflects the creation of new life, uh, not to be misunderstood. This man and woman in perfect union, by joining together man and woman in perfect harmony, new life is created. The arms stretching out is said to represent children. Okay, this is, I think this is another repetition of what we're saying, but you can see, just pay attention to uh, how there's, a, there's two females here on either side um, of the Ankh, and the hand holding up, and I think that represents to, meant to have represented the sun, but again, I'm not too certain, okay? I, 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 there's always been this obsession with solar cult symbology. I feel it represents the womb. That's what my interpretation of it is. And also notice the number six. Okay, these I think look like monkeys. Or, yeah, they look like baboons, actually. So, yeah, just, just look at the numerology as well. The six, uh, the number six seems to be representing. Yeah, so this, this uh, is a facsimile of a vignette from the Book of the, the Dead of Ani. So this is where it comes from. The sun, uh, the sun disc of the god Ra. Again, I, I don't think it's a sun disc. I think it's a womb disc. Right? Um, it's raised into the sky by, by an unk sign signifying life. And I think what does signify life? Not the sun, the womb. Because the womb is where life is created through the seed. The seed of life. So yeah, just to look at some of the, the crosses, uh, you can see on the top left you have the, uh, the Danish flag, you have the flag of England. This flag here is a sovereign uh, military order of Malta. I don't know if you've heard of the Knights of Malta, it's a secret society, Masonic uh, secret society. Uh, I think, I believe they were given Malta back in the uh, 1500s. And uh, they were a bunch, they were a group of knights, and they awarded the land because it wasn't it was an island. And from what I remember, I think it was an island. Anyway, they were awarded the land, and it turned it into a, a again a seafaring uh, seafaring port. And uh, you can see here their emblem as well of, of that. And yeah, you have the Swiss flag on the left, and then you have the Brit the Red Cross. Right, internationally known, the Red Cross is everywhere. Wherever there's war, where the Red Cross is there. Um, wonder what they harvest as well while, they, uh, while they're at it. Again, you get the city of London, you get the shield uh, with, the, with the two dragons. And we'll go into the dragons and the meaning of the dragons and the ancient significance of those. So yeah, uh, here you have uh, the Cross of Malta again. 
So on the top left, uh, you have the, uh, the York Right Order of the Knights Templar. So again, when we look at crosses, we have, we're talking about the Knights of Malta, we're talking about the Knights Templar, their significance in Normandy, in France, and uh, in, in England, and Scotland also. Uh, you have the York Right Masonic Jewel in the, in the centre there, in the top centre, the Order of the Knights of Malta, the York Right Masonic Jewel Order of the Red Cross. Okay, so when you see the Red Cross, there's an order, there's a sort of um, secret society behind it. And that's also another symbol of the Knights of Malta. And I believe that symbol as well is another, that's the Hospitalier, again, it's another, another symbol. Um, we have seven, seven points as well. Just make a note, make a mental note of the number seven and why the number seven is used. As we know, we can see the knights, uh, the, the cross of Malta there on the top of the, uh, the imperial crown uh, of, the, of Queen Elizabeth II during her coronation. So, again, I don't know if, I, if you recall, we can see also that same cross in, um, in the Nazi uniform. I don't know if you've seen the Nazi uniforms, they also have that cross on their collar. Um, I didn't include it on this one, but uh, something I just actually just remembered. So something to note, if you have, to have time, go and look up uh, the uh, Nazi uniform and you'll see the same cross that you see up there. Obviously no relation between the royal family and the Nazis. Let's just not look there. Uh, here's a, here is a, a picture of the, uh, the Vatican celebrating the Knights of Malta, who um, went to visit the Vatican uh, for their 900 year anniversary back in September 2013. You see, the thing is, these people do have faces, right? It's, it's not like they're completely hidden, and it's just that we can't put names to them. But they do come out, they do come out and play, they do come out into the daylight. It's, um, you know, whether we want to deal with them or not is another matter on its own. But, uh, you know, no human can, in the human realm anyway, can hide forever uh, from their crimes. And these people have been doing all sorts of war crimes over thousands of years through their family lines. Well, at least the last thousand years. Uh, on the right here, you have the winged goddess Isis, uh, Tutankhamun's and Tutankhamun's sarcophagus. Um, again, just notice the crucifixion, the crucifix style uh, position here. This is way more ancient than, than Christianity. Uh, it's a very old uh, sarcophagus. I can't remember. I think it's um, I think it's around 2000 BC. And you have also from the Greeks, uh, you have Prometheus. Again, represented in a cross, crucifix-like form. Also notice the skewed angle of the cross behind him as well, while we get the letter X and these other things. And this is also a lady bird from the 4th century BC from Gabon, which is North Africa as well. Very ancient. So yeah, 4th century, what's that? It's 400, 400 BC. Uh, so yeah, again, here, Minoan, Lord of the Wild Beasts, uh, the uh, Kereni in Crete, the Kereni civilization in Crete. Uh, you have, uh, just notice how this figure as well, like the others, is depicted between two others, right? Remember we had the two females in between the, the Ankh of Osiris? So again, we have this sort of repetition in these uh, other uh, civilizations. And, um, yeah, so debated between two others, like the gospel motif of the two thieves as well. So I don't know if you've heard of the two thieves, the gospel motif as well, worth checking out. This is 14th century, 1400 BC. You have the Jesus and the three Marys. All right, you always have these women around the, the, the crucifix. Um, I'm not sure if that's a woman, though. I'm not sure if the one on the left is a so but definitely two women. You also have the Aztec merchant god Yakata Yakata Kukli. Yatakata Kukli. 
as depicted in the Codex Fejiveri. I really recommend, if you have the time, check out this Codex. It's fascinating. Like, the images on there, it will freak you out. It has a sort of... Um, yeah, the, 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 I won't say too much. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, if you have the time, you could check this out. It really will fascinate you, this, this symbology in this uh, Fejiveri Codex. Fascinating things in there. But again, you can see him holding the cross, right? But he was actually a merchant god. And if you actually notice there, he's pointing a finger. And you can see footprints, right, on the uh, ends of the cross. And uh, that's basically pointing, you know, north, east, south. He was also uh, a travelling god and a merchant god. So, um, also notice the X again. Oh, the, the Minoans from Crete, were they left over from the Hyksos? Yeah. yeah, they're definitely related. Definitely. Definitely related from the Hyksos. The work the Minoans in yeah. the culture. It seems that what the when we talked about the Hyksos last week, um, uh, basically is, is a group of people that came from the east somehow and infiltrated the Egyptian civilizations. But yeah, they they seem to have copied because this is one thing we have to remember when we look at these symbols. They're much more ancient than these secret societies. They've claimed it for themselves. They've stolen the knowledge of our ancestors. Okay, and then they've claimed it and they used it for their own gain and to manipulate mankind to where we are today. That's what, what all this symbology is about. People always veer away from the occult and they are, oh, I don't want to talk about it all because of the sort of Christian stance on the occult. There's a sort of satanic element to it or a, a sort of dev, it's evil, don't go there. But actually it's one of the most important tools we can use to help ourselves. And you'll see as well, we can use this symbology for our own, to set up our own businesses, you know, um, and use it for our own gain. Uh, rather than kind of, and be honest, because, you know, you, you can use these symbols, but in a very clear way, uh, without having to kind of uh, manipulate it with fast food or things that are not good for you. Um, so you can use these symbols for yourself and empower yourself with them. Again, another depiction of, uh, just notice the ones that are dressed in white, not the ones in, in the other colours. Again, two, two, uh, and we have also the serpent imagery. Now, I have my own sort of views on this serpent imagery. I don't think it's actually a serpent, I think it's a sperm. Right, and there's, there's this other, um, uh, I will do this in another presentation when I go into hidden history. There is this other uh, wall mural as well, which depicts. Uh, it's quite a, you know, for, for most probably would be untasteful, but basically it's a it's a it's a pharaoh with an erect penis, and out of that penis is this snake coming out with this sort of head. And what makes me question this is how did they know if if how did they know the shape of the sperm without the microscope? I mean, you have to have a one thousand times magnification to get that symbol. Again, when we talk about life and death and, and how the ancient Egyptians viewed these things, they put all these symbols there for us. And it's a far more effective way of communicating uh, ancient and specific. Because uh, um, by, by looking at these symbols, when you kind of find the meaning and the understanding of it, then there's no room for interpretation anymore. So, uh, I find that quite fascinating that they use a the snake there. Again, he's got a, uh, a sort of scepter, again with a sort of hook. Notice that uh, also is used in, in Greek Orthodoxy, I believe, in, in Greek Orthodoxy uh, Christianity. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, you can spend hours looking at that and trying to interpret it. And there, there is people that have done some great work in interpreting these. Uh, so here's another uh, symbol from uh, the merchants of Virginia when the British went to invade uh, America. Um, they established, again, you know, to kind of taken over, wiping out a whole native race. Um, they established the Virginia Company Crest in 1607. 
It's called the Joint Stock Company of England. And uh, you can again see the same sort of similar symbology of the cross. Uh, we also see the significance of the crown and uh, the, again, the Knights Templar, the Knights Templar Knight there on the right, or the Knights of Malta, whichever one you want to call it, they're both the same. So moving on, we go uh, into the Cross of Lorraine. And uh, so this cross is derived from French her heraldry. And uh, the cross can be traced uh, back to the Crusades when Godfroy de Bouillon, de Bouillon? De Bouillon. De Bouillon. De Bouillon. Uh, the Duke of Lorraine, used it during the capture of Jerusalem in the 11th century. Uh, the cross was then uh, passed on to his successors as heraldic arms. Uh, by the 13th century, the Duke uh, of Anjou inherited it, and uh, uh, the icon became known as the Cross of Lorraine, representing the uh, national unity of France at that time. Uh, Lorraine, uh, region of France, is it Lorraine? Or Lo Lorraine. 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 Uh, original France has hosted many wars and battles. In the Second World War, when Hitler uh, took control of the region, uh, General de Gaulle uh, chose uh, to cross, chose the cross as a symbol of French resistance against uh, Germany. The cross was used as a symbolic reference to uh, Joanne of Arc, also, uh, who was from uh, Lorraine uh, as well, and is considered the national heroine of France as she led the French army against the foreign invaders. But notice here, you have two variations. The original version of the cross of Lorraine used to look like this, but you see they've made it patriarchal. As always, they, they modify things to affect the psyche. And uh, this has a patriarchal significance. You see, there's no balance in that symbol where you can see balance in this one. There's symmetry here, no symmetry there in that sense. If you were to cross it in half. So, the cross of Lorraine, as used in Freemasonry and worn by the Knights Templars, during the crusade by the permission of the king of Jerusalem. Uh, the oil and gas supergiant is, is also a descendant of J.D. Rockefeller, Exxon, uh, and uh, uh, Standard Oil. In 1999, merged with another descendant of Standard Oil, um, Mobil, uh, to form Exxon Mobil. The Cross of Lorraine remained. So you can see the Cross of Lorraine, if you were to tilt your head a bit sideways, mm -hmm. you can see the cross there on the Exxon symbol. Again, this is something I thought I'd use because I don't know if you've ever watched the V for Vendetta, v for Vendetta the film. Uh, really great film, really, really great film. And the bad guys are represented with this cross. That's why it didn't hit big during the cinemas. Anything that, that sort of kind of exposes them as the bad guys, they don't like. So there's a few, let's say, Forces of good in Hollywood, sadly not many, I would say probably around 5%, and every sort of 8 to 10 years they come out with a, a sort of anti-evil uh, anti film, you know, to inspire people. They tell us in these films. Uh, the National Biscuit Company, Nabisco, uh, the food processing company, was uh, founded in New Jersey in 1898 and began uh, marketing cookies and crackers. Oreo cookies hit the US market in 1912 and have been a best seller ever since. In 1985, RJ Reynolds bought out Nabisco in a leverage buyout. You can see this book, this uh, article, I think, book called Barbarians at the Gate, before being sold off to Kraft Foods. Have anybody heard of Kraft Foods? Yeah, quite a popular one. Uh, with uh, You get Philadelphia cheese made by Kraft uh, and various others. And again, Freemasons refer to masonry as the craft. Right? They call it the craft. They're crafting. That's what they do. 
So uh, tobacco giant Philip Morris also bought Kraft Foods in 2000 and spinned it off into a, into a different uh, company called um, uh, Mondelez International in 2011. Uh, the uh, the antenna-like logo was first used for the companies now discontinued, uh, Anita Biscuits. Uh, so you have the in uh, seal, which you used to have in the packs of Oreos. Right? When you open up the pack, you ha used to have the inner seal in there. Interesting, again, you can see the use of the cross of Lorraine there on the biscuit. Also, if you pay attention closely, it looks like a geometric flower, no? Pay attention to the, uh, to the, uh, yeah, to the circles. I think someone did some great work on that. But, uh, yeah, fascinating, even in food, how they put this stuff, you know, and we're eating it, we're, we're eating, ultimately, crap, uh, don't know what they've alchemically mixed in there to affect our brains, to affect our bodies, all right? They put it in everything. Uh, anybody recognize this, this place? No? no? This is the hotel that Martin Luther King was killed in. Called the L Martin Luther King. Right? Killed in the Lorraine Motel. Right? So, they tell you this, <laughs> they tell you in a very indirect way what they do. Right? It's, the signs are there if you can see it with the eye of knowledge as a uh, Friedrich Nietzsche used to say. Okay. Uh, you also have the Leviathan Satanic Cross. Okay. But it used to be called the Leviathan Cross and then the Church of Satan. But I'll go into that now. The symbol has been, uh, has been uh, used as a symbol for sulfur. That's what I was trying to find in the, uh, in the alch alchemical. I don't think that, I think, the, I think it's, it is pretty much identical, pretty much the same. Um, and yeah, so the symbol for sulfur and alchemy for a long time before it became the symbol of Satan. Uh, there are no records indicating a date, but it is uh, probably very old as alchemy has existed as a discipline since the ancient times. Uh, so how did the sulfur symbol end up to be the Satan's cross? Um, the symbol became the Leviathan cross, also known as the Satanic cross, Satan's cross and Brimstone Cross, along with some other names, when Anton Levy, or Levi, I think that's how his uh, name is pronounced, uh, the founder of the Church of Satan, adopted it as the emblem of his church in, in the 1960s. It should be noted that there are no accounts in history attributing the said symbol to Satanism before Levi adopted it. I just want to draw your name to the name Anton, right? Uh, again, hidden history, Chris, you might be aware of this. Aton. Interesting how they use these names. Aton, Anton, Satan, Saturn. So, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche says, as long as you still experience the stars as something above your head, you lack the eye of knowledge. Okay? It's very important. I, I will go through this in, the, in a part two in the future about the significance of uh, the stars in symbology and significance to their effect on our psyche um, and how the geomagnetic fields work with, astro you know, with the astrological alignments and the processions. Uh, but mostly it's an, internal, it's an internalized reflection. The stars, when we look up, we see the shapes. It's what you see. It's not uh, it's a reflection of our psyche. It's a reflection of our inner being. When we look at the stars, that's the relationship because the stars were revered by the ancient Egyptians as the great night mother, the womb, the night sky. Um, so I think we'll stop there and have a little break. Let our brains process a little bit, have a bit of tea, and then we'll come back and do yeah. the second part.